So most of the talks this morning were on uh, tropical cyclones and extreme precipitation. This is another form of extreme precipitation, but I'm going to be focusing mainly in the Pacific Basin now, even though atmospheric rivers also form in the Atlantic um, sector. But we're going to be looking at the large-scale precursor weather patterns that occur before these atmospheric river landfalls. And this is important from a predictability standpoint. So um, as Ben mentioned, um, I'm a vis visiting scientist at NCAR in Boulder. Um, but the work, this work is done in collaboration with Amy Clement at, in Rasmus, as well as Brian Medeiros, who is our colleague at, um, in, uh, in, at NCAR. I'm not going to talk about atmospheric rivers in the next two slides, but I want to talk about some of the impacts that atmospheric rivers can play a role in um, in the uh, uh, Western North America. So if you, may, you might remember in various media reports from um, February of 2017, the Orville Dam incident. This is in north central California. Um, during this time, uh, there was a reservoir in central California. There was 12.8 inches of rain fell over a five-day period in February. Um, water was released through a main spillway, but that was damaged. And then uh, they had to open up the emergency spillway, and that eroded all the way back to the, the line, the, the, basically the border holding up the reservoir. Um, and so they had to open up the main spillway again, and that got severely damaged. You can sort of see it in the picture on the bottom here. Um, so it was a, a lot of damage. Both the spillways were damaged. Um, there is actually an 800 megawatt hydroelectric plant, uh, which you can see in the bottom left figure there, that had to be closed because all of the debris that fell into the river blocked the river, preventing the water from flowing out. There was a man mandatory evacuation of 188,000 people, $875 million worth of damage, and uh, cleanup took more than two years. And now contrast that with what happened 19 months later. Uh, this is the campfire. Obviously, atmospheric rivers don't cause uh, wildfires, but a lack of atmospheric rivers can change the seasonal precipitation. Amazingly, and I didn't know this until I looked into this, but amazingly, the campfire was only 15 miles away from the Oroville Dam incident, which is just mind-blowing to me. Um, campfire was the deadliest and most destructive wildfire in California recorded history. It had $16.5 billion of insured losses, which made it the most costly natural disaster in the world in 2018. 95% of Paradise, California was destroyed in six hours. Population of that town is 26,000. Uh, there were 85 fatalities. Tens of thousands of structures were destroyed. It obviously had major socioeconomic impacts, um, including air quality. And this, oops, uh, this picture down here you can see. So this is, this is on the left-hand side of the figure. This is during the campfire when smoke infiltrated into the Bay Area. And then on the right-hand side is a, is a clear day. So it has major, um, major impacts. Um, so now, how do, how do atmospheric rivers play into this? Um, an atmospheric river is defined as a transient filamentary plume of enhanced water vapor transport. It's typically associated with a low-level jet um, um, ahead of a cold front in a mid-latitude baroclinic storm. Uh, and you can see this animation. Um, you can see this animation here on the left. So you can really see the, the filamentary nature of these, and they last a, a few days. Um, but importantly, atmospheric rivers are also closely tied to extreme precipitation. So this plot on the, on the right, um, this is showing um, the AR impact on extreme precipitation. So the red shading um, indicates, that the deep red shading indicates where during the presence of an AR, you increase your probability of ex exceeding your climatological 95th percentile of precipitation, which I'm calling extreme. You increase your chances of experiencing extreme precipitation by 10 times um, what you would if there was not an atmospheric river. So this is essentially saying that atmospheric rivers uh, go hand in hand with extreme precipitation. It's a, it's a, it's a fancy way of saying that. Um, another important thing about ARs is that they deliver a large portion of the seasonal precipitation. 
um, in the western United States, especially along the, along the coast. So they deliver approximately 20 to 60% of the annual precipitation, but in the western United States, that's typically between October and April, um, the boreal winter months. In this sense, they're, they're traditionally viewed as, um, ARs are traditionally views, viewed as a weather feature, but I'm, I'm arguing that they should also be considered um, uh, critical for um, representation in climate models because they influence the interannual precipitation variability. They have uh, wide-ranging impacts from water availability, obviously, um, but also energy production, agriculture, and recreation. And so now getting back to those two events that I showed at the beginning, the Orville Dam incident, which was too much precipitation, and the campfire, which was a lack, a sustained lack of precipitation over a long period of time, we can trace back that variability directly to atmospheric river um, uh, frequency. So on the left, uh, upper left panel, you can see the purple shading over California indicates much above average precipitation. And hand in hand with that, on the on the upper right panel, you can see that there are a large number of atmospheric river events that occurred during that, um, during that winter season, water year. Um, but then in the bottom panel, that was when the, that was the year, the water year leading up to the campfire, there was a distinct lack of precipitation, the red, mostly red shading. Um, I should point out that, oops, I should point out that the Oroville Dam and campfire incidents were right about here. And so you can see that there was a distinct lack of atmospheric river activity um, during that water year. So um, now just to review. So we saw that atmospheric rivers are narrow plumes of intense water vapor transport. They're involved in flooding and seasonal um, precipitation variability. They have large socioeconomic impacts. So now um, sort of as a roadmap for the rest of the talk, I'm going to um, uh, uh, pose three important questions um, with the uh, basically indicating that it's critical to represent atmospheric rivers in climate models, not just weather models, in climate models. So what we want to know, what we set out to do in our study is to understand the large-scale controls of atmospheric rivers. What weather patterns evolve in the days and weeks leading up to atmospheric river landfalls in the western United States? Um, are these precursor patterns represented well in um, global climate models, GCMs? And is there a way to simplify the problem? Because this is, atmospheric science is an inherently complex problem, um, and we'd like to simplify it as much as possible. And we do that um, using an idealized model called an aquaplanet, in which there is no land. Um, and I'll get into that in a, in a moment. So, Atmospheric rivers can be influenced by both tropical processes and extratropical processes. For our talk, I'm going to talk. I'm going to um, review mostly the extratropical drivers, but I wanted I wanted to just put a slide um, of the tropical drivers as well. And I think Libby Barnes, who has the next talk, will will um, touch on this maybe a little bit more. So one um, from a seasonal standpoint, the El Nino Southern Oscillation or ENSO can influence atmospheric river statistics along the western coast of, the, of, the, uh, of North America. Uh, but also the Madden-Julian oscillation, which some of you may or may not have heard of, is also a strong driver of subseasonal variability in the western United States and elsewhere. And the MJO is basically um, an, an area of um, enhanced precipitation that propagates very slowly eastward from the Indian Ocean into the western Pacific. And the condensational heating that comes from that precipitation can drive circulation changes in the extratropics that can change where atmospheric rivers are more likely to form. Um, so the MJO has different phases, and I'm not going to get into the details of how that's defined, but the different phases basically, the phase number tells you where the maximum rainfall of the MJO is associated, is located. And when M the MJO is in phase three, uh, you have this. Um, oops, sorry. You have this change in AR frequency. So the green shade means that ARs are more likely to form in that region, and in the brown shading means ARs are less likely to form in that region. So in 
in going from phase three to phase eight, you can see there's this sloshing of um, AR is tending to form in phase three more on the northwestern, north and western sides of the Pacific Basin. And in phase eight, they're more likely to form on the south and eastern side of the basin. So this is just indicating that there is a link between MJO and atmospheric river um, statistics. So now, the extratropical drivers. Um, so I'm going to show, I hope, an animation of um, the evolution of the, basically the weather pattern um, uh, preceding an atmospheric river landfall at this bullseye point. And the bullseye, is, in this case, is off the coast of Oregon. It's a small little dot there. The shaded colors are geopotential height at 500 hectopascals. All the signals I'm showing are statistically significant. The wind vectors are low-level wind fields, and the contours are integrated water vapor transport, which is a proxy for an atmospheric river. It's how we define atmospheric rivers. So you can see that even 14 days out, there's a statistically marginally st statistically significant signal over Alaska. And the red shading means positive geopotential height anomalies. Um, and this would be associated with positive uh, pressure anomalies. And well, I'm going to call this a ridge. But you'll see how this ridge um, develops and evolves over time. So let's see if this works. OK, great. So the ridge uh, sort of blossomed over Alaska. And it retrograded westward into eastern Siberia. And it intensified. And at the same time, we had these dual low pressure areas um, spanning the Pacific Basin, one over the northeastern Pacific and one over the western Pacific. And uh, the black solid contours you can see, that's sort of the uh, initial formation of the atmospheric river, which is going to be mostly zonal across the entire Pacific Basin. So now I'll continue. Now we're six days before atmospheric river landfall. And I'll continue this. And you'll see that the two blue blobs merge. Um, and the whole system sort of wraps up. Oh, I forgot to mention, yeah, merging of Pacific lows and atmospheric river landfall. OK, so that's going to happen now. OK, so you can see now that ridge that was over Siberia is still sort of there. The northeast Pacific low has intensified immensely. And there's also an intensification of the downstream um, this would be considered uh, Rossby wave breaking here. Um, and so we, we, we understand that this pattern seems to be important for atmospheric river landfalls. Um, so these are the precursor patterns that I'm talking about. We see that these patterns emerge more than one week in advance. So we can use them to our advantage to um, predict atmospheric river landfalls and their associated impacts. Uh, the, what I should, yeah, I want to also mention that um, this was for a base point in Oregon. Unfortunately, if you took a base point in Southern California, the pattern would be similar, but not exactly the same. You'll notice that um, that high latitude ridge uh, plays a lot lesser, uh, uh, less important role for the Southern California atmospheric rivers. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, but in general, um, the patterns are, are qualitatively similar. I'm going to focus more on the Oregon, uh, on the Oregon landfall uh, going forward. So uh, we saw that there's this high latitude ridge that seems to be important for um, the atmospheric rivers that make landfall over Oregon. And now this slide is meant to sort of break down the different processes that are going on with that. Um, and I also want to introduce another concept, which is called blocking. And blocking is. Um, basically a, a stagnation of the flow pattern um, in the extratropics that can develop. It's often uh, associated with um, heat waves, especially in Europe of recent years. Um, atmospheric blocking tends to cause persistent weather patterns over a period of five to seven or, or more days. So we're going to try to find out if blocking is playing an influence in atmospheric river landfalls as well. Um, the short answer is yes. Uh, so the green contours I'm showing here are um, uh, 200 hectopascal stream function, uh, which basically means that, uh, ah, sorry, the flow around uh, the solid contours is in a um, 
cyclonic fashion, and the flow around the dash contours is an anti-cyclonic fashion. So one question we ask is, uh, is this high latitude ridge associated with blocking? Well, we've done a blocking, uh, we use a blocking metrics to confirm that yes, the green shading indicates that this, these are areas of blocking, so this ridge is associated with atmospheric blocking. Um, let me just simplify this a little bit. So the next colors that you'll see are um, uh, uh, synoptic storm activity, I'll call it. Um, it's a vari variance associated with synoptic eddies. In the blocking, what the blocking does is the purple shades indicate that it suppresses synoptic eddy activity over the north central part of the basin. That's uh, step number two. And then what happens uh, in association with that, now these solid black contours are the low level zonal wind anomalies. And you, and you can see that there's a, um, the dash contours indicate um, negative anomalies and like solid contours indicate positive anomalies. So you can see that there are, there's a, a zone of negative black contours here and positive black contours here. And that indicate, that's basically indicating that the storm track, the storm track is the, is the channel that mid-latitude storms travel along. The storm track has shifted southward. And it's shifted southward to the latitude of atmospheric river landfall. And so the storms, what used to be traveling on a farther northern trajectory, are now shifted southward because of this um, blocking pattern. And now they're impinging directly on um, Oregon or California and so forth. So this is the kind of the physical mechanism of what's going on. Okay, so we saw, uh, just to recap this uh, subsection, we saw that the Madden-Julian oscillation and ENSO can change ENSO, um, atmospheric river probabilities and landfall locations. We also saw that um, atmospheric rivers have a distinct extratropical precursor weather pattern that emerges approximately a week to a little bit more um, ahead of atmospheric river landfall. And we found that bl atmospheric blocking was playing a fairly ro large role in this. Okay, so now um, we'll look briefly at how the models are performing in capturing this variability. I'm gonna show a few simulations, um, or results from a few simulations of the Community Earth System Model version two, which was released uh, in June of 2018. Um, there are two different types of models that we're using. The first is called fully coupled, and that's where all the model components, the atmosphere, the ocean, land, sea ice, they're all prognostic, they're all active. Um, it's on a one degree horizontal grid, which that doesn't really matter at this point. Uh, the second set of simulations is what I referred to earlier as the idealized models. So this is, we're using an aquaplanet. The aquaplanet is incredibly simple. Um, it has SSTs that we prescribe to it, which are very simple. It has no land, no sea ice, no seasons, and it has very simple aerosols. So the idea is to try to distill the problem to its most salient features and, and use that as a framework. We also do a little bit of adding uh, some complexity incrementally, and I'll talk about that um, uh, in the next few slides. So um, the upper left-hand plot here is the atmospheric river frequency of occurrence. And you can see that most atmospheric rivers tend to form somewhere in the, in the, um, across the Pacific Basin. Uh, the model, which is on, on the bottom, the model difference from observation is indicating that the model is underrepresenting atmospheric rivers, uh, but it's only a marginal underrepresentation. It's not statistically significant. So the model is producing slightly too few atmospheric rivers, but in general, it's doing an okay job. Um, I'm, I'm actually not going to talk about this that much. I don't think it's worth. Uh, there are differences in the mean state, and those differences can explain um, the differences that we see in the model in terms of atmospheric river um, frequencies, and I'm not going to talk about this. One thing I will say, though, is that um, the model, uh, we, we saw that there was a connection between the Madden Julian oscillation and atmospheric rivers. The model tends to um, weakly underestimate the... Uh, variability associated with the Madden Julian oscillation, and that probably has knock-on effects to its, to its underestimation of atmospheric rivers. So those two are, are connected. How does the model do in getting these um, extratropical forcing patterns? 
Um, on the left column is observations or reanalysis. On the right hand column is the model. You can see that the patterns are pretty well aligned. The model is doing a pretty good job at getting these large scale precursor patterns. Um, but one thing it's not doing well is uh, the time evolution of atmospheric blocking. And um, so the solid green, uh, lag, lag day is on the, is on the x-axis. And this is, um, oh, this doesn't work anymore. OK, lag day is on the x-axis. This is indicating days uh, leading up to an atmospheric river landfall. Negative days means prior to atmospheric landfall. The, the line contours are simply um, block, blocking, uh, blocking frequency over eastern Siberia. And the solid line is uh, reanalysis or observations. And the dashed line is the model. And you can see that the model is doing two things. First, it's underrepresenting um, atmospheric blocking. And it's also <laughs> shifting the peak in blocking to about three days before what it should be, according to observations. So the blocking ridge is, is forming too early, and it's too weak in the model. OK, so now some, some more um, interesting results. Uh, we'll now look at idealized model. Again, this is um, designed to, um, to simplify the problem, to identify the most salient features of uh, the processes that are going on. Idealized modeling also um, reduces the computational cost. If you have no seasons, that means that you're running, in, uh, you're running the model in, say, perpetual equinox mode. That means you don't have to worry about uh, variability related to the seasons. And so you don't need to run as many years as you would otherwise if you were running with seasonality. There's no land, so there's no complications associated with land um, that can crop up. So it's a very simple framework that we're hoping to uh, cultivate to better understand um, different processes, atmospheric rivers being one of them. So on the upper left, I'm showing surface temperature uh, average from November to April. And um, on, the uh, sorry, on the upper right, that's the resulting atmospheric river frequency of occurrence. So you can see that their atmospheric rivers tend to form over the Pacific Basin. They also tend to form over the Atlantic Basin. And even in the southeast United States, including um, in, in this area. Um, but I'm not going to focus on that um, right now. The aquaplanet simulation, the control aquaplanet run that we did is in the bottom left. That's surface temperatures. You can see it's a very simple, zonally uniform sea surface temperature profile. The equator is warm. The poles are cold. There's no sea ice. So the North Pole is actually 0 Celsius at the surface. So that's a clear limitation. On the, right hand, on the lower right, that's, where, that's the atmospheric river frequency of occurrence, just like in the upper, upper right. So now you can see that in our, in our control run, atmospheric rivers are likely to form at any longitude, but they're within, restricted within a, um, a certain latitudinal band. So what the, goal, the goal that we wanted to do is to get the lower right panel to look more like the upper right panel. And so how do we do that? Well, we can do that actually pretty easily with two steps. Uh, this is surprisingly easy. So um, in the upper left, I'm showing the sea surface temperature plot from the control aquaplanet. And then as you go down the left column, um, these are different um, anomalies that we've added to the surface temperature um, by doing different things. And I'll, get, I'll come back to that in a second. On the right-hand side are the respective changes to the atmospheric river frequency of occurrence, where atmospheric rivers form. So if you go, if you see the, the warm pool um, on the left-hand side, I don't think, like, oh, I guess it does. So in the warm pool plot on the left-hand side, we've added a really simple representation of the Indo-Pacific warm pool and the Eastern Pacific cold SST. And, uh, and we changed the atmospheric river statistics in, in, in this way. So now we've begun to consolidate, weakly consolidate atmospheric rivers in the Pacific Basin, which is what we wanted. Um, what we also tried adding Himalayas. So th these are aqua mountains. The terrain is like a bump of water. <laughs> and the surface temperature is decreased um, 
um, simultaneous with that to try to mimic what the actual terrain is doing in terms of surface temperature. So we've added the Himalayas and we get, we get this feature here. Um, so we're also consolidating atmospheric rivers downstream of the mountains. And when you add uh, the warm pool and the Himalayas together in the bottom row, you, you basically can reproduce um, the atmospheric river statistics over the Pacific Ocean just by doing those two things. It's sort of a linear combination of the two, of the two features. So um, now on the left-hand panel, I'm showing the atmospheric river frequency of occurrence for the control run, and then with the uh, aqua planet with the warm pool and the Himalayas, and then this is the fully coupled model. And you can see that there's a pretty good correspondence between, um, between the aqua planet that we made and the um, fully coupled model. One thing I will say is that we don't have rocky mountains in our aqua planet, so there should be no expectation that anything uh, east of the coastline should have uh, any similarity to what actually happens in the fully coupled model. We get these improvements basically because we make an improved um, Pacific jet stream um, in the model, and I don't have time to get into that more, but not only do we improve the representation of air statistics in the Pacific and our aqua planet, but the precursor weather patterns that that drive the, the uh, atmospheric rivers in our aqua planet are also very similar to what we see in the fully coupled model or in observations. So the aqua planet is doing a really good job, even though it's incredibly simple. Um, references for completeness. We have some papers uh, that are out or coming out soon. And then I think this is just the take home, this is the take home points that I wanna make. So we saw that atmospheric rivers um, have widespread socioeconomic impacts. They drive flooding events. They're associated with um, um, seasonal precipitation as well. It's important that we represent them well in climate models. We also saw that the um, extratropical precursor weather patterns, um, these are distinct from tropical forcings as far as we can tell. They develop about one week or more in advance of atmospheric river landfall. And they um, typically involve high latitude blocking and the model, our, the model that we looked at, CESM2, does a, does a fairly good job at capturing these precursor patterns and atmospheric river statistics, although the blocking in the model is um, too weak and uh, the time is, is misaligned relative to observations. Um, and then lastly, we also saw that just by using this simple aquaplanet framework, we can, um, we can uh, use that framework to better understand atmospheric river processes, but you can also do things like um, impose particular sea surface temperature distributions like global warming, or if you think that the Pacific SS zonal SST gradient is gonna change in the future, you can um, impose that and see what the impact would be on um, atmospheric river landfalls. So we think it's a, we think it's a very useful framework to, um, to better understand these kind of processes. Thanks.